Joe Milton is a guy that this time last year was on the verge of his greatest game, right? Um, he was getting ready to play in the Orange Bowl, and everyone got incredibly excited about his play. One player actually told me, though, that to be quite frank, he was, uh, or one person in the program, I should say, that he was surprised by how well Joe Milton played. And I think that played out that he wasn't a great quarterback this year. So uh, my question for you, and it is today's tough question, and we'll get to it right now. It's brought to you by Andy Mason of AndyMasonRealEstate.com. Today's tough question. Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. Is Joe Milton the most disliked quarterback in Tennessee football history? I don't know if he's the most disliked, but he's right up there. Uh, the most disappointing, perhaps, to some people. But if you look at Tennessee's quarterbacks, they're usually pretty beloved, John. But you thought of this topic and the fact that Tennessee went eight and four, could have could have played better, could have won more games with some better quarterback play, I believe. I ask you, uh, do you believe he's the most disliked a Tennessee quarterback, at least in the modern era? Um. I think for a quarterback who's had a modicum of success, I mean, Tennessee did has won eight games with Joe Milton at quarterback this season. He won two more at the end of last year, won the Bowling Green game too. So I guess over and all, he's about 11 and five as a starter. Um, the timing had something to do with it. He followed a really good quarterback and there's so much anticipation over Nico, just so much more so than any quarterback Tennessee's had. Uh, I don't, I, I guess in looking back, I would think probably Jarrett Garantano was more disliked. And and let's keep in mind, I don't know if it's necessary to say this, it's nothing personal uh, with fans. They don't look at this as personalities. It's just about a job performance. And uh, I would say Jarrett Garantano, uh, there've been quarterbacks who's, who have had less success uh, than Joe Milton, who probably w weren't as disliked as he is. Uh, I remember uh, Jonathan Crompton. I don't think people were thrilled about him in 2008 when he started. Uh, came to like him in 2009 under Lane Kiffin because he did he turned things around uh, with his own career with that season. So I, I would say Garrett Tano was probably – tops the list he was here so long he started for parts of four seasons yep. uh go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button we want you a part of the program and hit the bell too and we're going to go to the message for today's tough question is brought to you by andy mason of andy mason real estate.com and he's got over 40 years of experience in the biz and he can also uh tell you that he's got the best service and the best prices Caleb, I will say this. It would have been Jonathan Crompton and not close had it not been for the second half of his senior year because he was so highly talented and publicized, partly by me at the time. And he was one of the highest rated quarterbacks in, in Tennessee football history. He had that last half of the season. And I think a lot of fans were empathetic about the fact that the coaching staff was um, – just in flux uh, while he was there. And I think that people forgive him for that because of the transition from Fulmer to Kiffin. So I don't think it's Crompton um, for sure. But as far as a guy that caught a lot of flack during his play, that's about the closest I can come up with. More so than Garantano? I don't know. Let me ask you, Caleb. What do you think? Um, okay, so I, I'm going to go to somebody different from both of them, but I want to address both of them for a minute. Garantano got a lot of flack for his play, and it was very frustrating for people to watch. But I do distinctly remember, I think the second half of Jonathan Crompton's 09 season makes people forget how hated he was before that. There was... Yeah. There, there were, there he were made-up stories, and you guys were covering the program, I wasn't. But I'm just going to tell you guys, there were some made-up stories 
that I can tell you I don't believe for a, for a, at all. And I've never believed him. I'm just going to say one rumor on one vol message board was a time where Peyton Manning spoke to the team and they accused Jonathan Cropton of getting up and leaving. There is a 100% chance that didn't happen. Uh, okay, so they, they it was just... He got death threats to his family. He got a lot, a lot of flack. And also, you got to remember with Jonathan Crompton, that was the start of the decade of dysfunction. Tennessee hadn't been used to it. However, I'm going with somebody who actually was productive, but had the worst intangibles in the history of football, and that's Tyler Bray. And I think even though Tyler Bray actually performed well, I think plenty of people saw a complete lack of care from him, complete lack of intangibles. He put more effort into throwing beer bottles and trash cans than he did trying to will his team to win. And we all watched him. And Dave, you weren't covering at the time, but John, what do you think of the rumor? I do believe it. I do believe Tyler Bray and Derek Rogers purposely quit in that Kentucky game because they didn't want to go to a bowl. Well, there was a considerable speculation about that. And it was, a, as you remember, a dreadful performance. That was Kentucky playing with a, both of its quarterbacks were hurt, and it moved a former high school quarterback from wide receiver, Matt Rourke, to quarterback. And he just kept running the ball, and Kentucky pulled out a win, and it was pro the worst game of the Derrick Dooley era. And there was a lot of speculation about that. And I think that's a very good point. I thought about Tyler Bray, and then I thought about, yeah, he had really good stats. Uh, and he did his last year, that uh, 2012, he had really good stats. But you're right. There was always a feeling, and not just with Bray, but with that team, like you wondered how much it cares. So I think it's uh, good that you uh, you brought him up because sometimes it's not just about your stats or how you turned out professionally. He hung around the NFL for a while. He may still be there for all I know. But, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> – that that's a real that's a really good point and i think there are other there might be some other guys like that i i noticed one of our twitter people mentioned uh eric ainge after the sec championship game for throwing that in for throwing <laughs> that, that interception. interception i know it was it was like it was perfectly timed like it had been orchestrated they practiced it okay here we go sec champion lsu well, and Ainge deserves a little bit of post-playing credit for getting the uh, Georgia fans all riled up at Sanford Stadium, uh, uh, what, two years ago? Or was that? No, it was last year. Uh, yeah. Last uh, year by saying that it wasn't a very loud place to play. You know I love you, Eric. But uh, I do think that that caught hold, and then suddenly a lot of people uh, in Georgia said, well, you just see how loud we can be. And he had pre-snap penalties and everything else. So I, I don't know of any other guy that we can count postseason um, performances on to be the most disliked ball, except for Eric. No, and, and I think, yeah, he probably, Georgia should pay him to come down there and fire up the crowd. I, I mean, Sterling Hinton does a great <laughs> job of that with Tennessee. But I, with the Georgia crowd, he's got a history now. They might really respond if he went out there and give him a microphone and let him say how bad their fan base is, and they'll respond respond in kind. Does Quick it, history point. Yes. Oh, sorry. And, and, and you guys, you guys tell me if I'm way off with this. I see. I see Joe Milton as a guy who people aren't going. They're going to remember fondly as a person, but not as a great quarterback, but he'll still be remembered fondly because I, you just brought up Sterling Hinton. I think Sterling Hinton is that way. Funny enough. And wasn't the greatest quarterback lost his starting job, but he's remembered fondly. And an, another one that I bring up is Jimmy Streeter. I think Tennessee fans love the Jimmy Streeter, but well, unlike Tennessee was that good when he played those three years, they were actually awful, but people no, respected him. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, uh, because, yeah, a lot of the – again, it's not personal. A lot of these guys were – like, personally, I think if you look at what Joe Milton did, he returned to Tennessee. Uh, he could have transferred. I'm not sure where he would have gone, but he could have transferred again. Uh, but he stayed at Tennessee, and I think fans respect him for that. He was a team leader. Fans respect him for that. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's part of it. But, but you know how fans – Fans remember particularly like the fan who brought up the Eric Ainge interception in the 2007 SEC title game. Those kind of things really stick with fans. 
I mean, somebody could have had a pretty good career overall. And like, like you brought up with Tyler Bray in that Kentucky game when the speculation that Tennessee didn't really want to go to a bowl game. Those are the things that really stick with fans, a particular play or a particular game. You know, I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> defend for a moment uh, Joe Milton for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, he did not have the same crew of receivers, especially with Brew McCoy gone as one of the most beloved quarterbacks, which he was following. And you never want to be the guy to follow the guy. You want to be the guy that follows the guy that follows the guy. In other words, I used Martin. to always say, uh, yeah, I used to always say that about <laughs> John Ward. I mean, I, I, I thought at the time that Bob Kessling had an incredibly tough job to be compared to John Ward. So I think that following Hendon Hooker, there was no way he was going to match that amount of success. I thought that early on, but I think a lot of fans expected the offense just to keep on trucking and everything would be fine. So I'm going to defend Joe Milton for a second. I don't think he had the offensive line stability early in the season with Cooper Mays. That cost him the Florida game. And I don't think that he had nearly the receivers and you had teams that were more prepared for Josh Heupel because they didn't want to get him embarrassed. I mean, Tennessee still surprised a lot of teams in 2022. I don't think them on the schedule playing well surprised any teams last year, guys. Okay, let I me thought, get your go ahead, John. Well, uh, yeah, when you mentioned about Hendon Hooker, I don't think any quarterback uh, at Tennessee has ever been put in a position with so many things going against him popularity wise and in a way job performance wise you mentioned Hendon Hooker who one of the really the great quarterbacks in the modern era of Tennessee football uh, he's following him and he's also the predecessor to the famous heir apparent in Nico Yamaleava and so that that's another thing working against him there's been more fanfare about Nico than there was Peyton Manning uh, then a third thing is belief in Josh Heupel's system. And I'm, and I'm guilty of this. I just felt like after watching Heupel's offense for two years, particularly his first season, when I didn't think the talent level was as high, and he averaged almost 40 points a game in that first season, I really believed, well, it doesn't matter. He'll find a way to score 40 points a game. He just will with his system and his creativity. And I was wrong about that. But that was another thing going against Milton because fans believed, well, anybody's going to put up great numbers in this system. And Joe Milton hasn't put up great numbers. All right. I know we had a little bit of lagging issue, but we're, we're back and good to go. So, uh, yeah, I think that Joe Milton faced the perfect storm coming into the season that you, you might have some people that were uh, had expectations a little bit to – too high so uh here we go now some people are having to okay i think we're all good now on our audio issue but i apologize we for also have to point this out and i said this at the time i said the clock was reset on joe milton in the orange bowl but guys i think we didn't really look i, I think we misread the orange bowl last year uh and what i mean by that is i think we overrated how joe milton played in that game tennessee what tennessee had 10 drives in that game and came away scoreless in five of them and only had four touchdown drives on 10 offensive drives. Joe Milton, his stats are very pedestrian outside of a 50-yard pass to Squirrel White and a 46-yard pass to Ramel Keaton. I didn't think he played as great as everybody thought in that Orange Bowl game. He didn't look like Hendon Hooker or that. It did not look like the offense that we had seen all year. There was a dramatic drop-off even in that Orange Bowl game. And I think, I think because Joe Milton outperformed his own expectations for that game, it all of a sudden created Hendon Hooker-like expectations for him this year. Yeah, I was. I, I thought that I, I uh, overestimated his performance in that game, and part of it was that I didn't have high expectations for him going into that game. You know how it is when you think somebody probably won't do that well; it'd be pretty average. So he throws three touchdown passes, doesn't make any turnovers. It was kind of a pressure situation, and so much was put on him. So I looked at all those things and thought, "Wow." Uh, he's much better than I expected. And that's probably that had a lot to do with why I thought Tennessee could go 10 and two this year. 
Today's tough question brought to you by Andy Mason, andymasonrealestate.com. Real estate experts with over four decades of combined experience in East Tennessee. Best prices, best service in the Knoxville area, andymasonrealestate.com. So vote on our poll question. Here's what we've got so far. Most disliked ball quarterback. I put three choices up there. Joe Milton, Jared Garantano, and Tyler Bray. So far, Garantano is lapping the field. He has 79% of the vote. Joe Milton and Tyler Bray battling it out for 11%. My. Uh, Jared Garantano don't really don't, don't like... Jared Garantano was in the worst possible situation, though, guys. I mean, I think he really was. Him. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, how many I, different I, offensive coordinators, guys? How many different offensive coordinators did he, did he have? How many different head coaches did he have? And Jeremy yeah. Pruitt. Could you have? Could a quarterback have a worse coach than Jeremy Pruitt? <laughs> no. Probably not. Larry Scott, I, but Jones is offensive coordinator, who Garantano also had. <laughs> I would probably go Tyler Bray to be real honest with you, because I, I, I mean, you have to have some leadership ability, and to have one off-field incident is bad. To have two with a jet <laughs> ski is even worse. What about those? Was there a thing about the golf balls? Was he throwing golf balls at people? I, I can't. Beer bottles. The, Beer bottles. Oh, I'm, am I confusing that with the uh, Neyland Stadium incident the with Lane, uh, Kiffin. Lane Kiffin? Gosh, I thought there was a golf ball involved in uh, Tyler Bray's past. Uh, maybe I'll look into that later. They're, they're, they're Tyler might, Bray well, had yeah. the. I want to say this, and you guys have covered Tennessee a little longer than I have, but I will say that as far as me watching, Tyler Bray had the best arm of anybody I've ever seen play for Tennessee. When I, when I, I'm talking strength, touch, and accuracy. I don't think anybody had a better arm. And that's why I kind of dislike him the most is I think he wasted his potential. If he had a semblance of intangibles, he'd have been starting in the NFL one day. I think w what would have been cool if uh, if uh, Caleb would have been with the NFL franchise and general manager's role and Tyler Bray had come out the same time Peyton Manning did and Caleb would have taken Tyler Bray. I would not have because I believe in intangibles. I believe well, in intangibles. We know Caleb wouldn't have taken a punter. That's <laughs> <laughs> for sure. As Caleb, does well, the New Orleans would, Saints I, drafted Russell Erksleben once. I, he might have been. He was a high, high round pick. I don't know if it was first round. What's the highest you would take a punter, Caleb? Never. I don't think you should ever. I'll I would never draft him. a punter. <laughs> No, I would never draft. Never. I would draft. By the way, but but here's my crazy self. I would draft a kicker after a quarterback. I think a kicker is the second most important position on the field. A good kicker changes everything in football. Oh, Tom Brady's boy. got three Kick. rings because of Vinatieri. Oh, oh my gosh! Golly, All right, Caleb is a study in contradictions. He is. Uh, no, I'm an analytics guy. I believe in analytics.